everybody. Welcome to Child-Centered Play Therapy, aka Person-Centered Therapy for Kids. So, a little bit about where this uh, slideshow is coming from. So, Dr. Hickman, the other person who's teaching theories right now, and I, um, Audrey Robinson, who's teaching currently teaching theories right now, kind of put our heads together based on some feedback from you guys in class saying like, okay, great, you know, we get what this looks like, but I can't really see how me as someone who's going to work with kids or me as someone who's going to work as a school counselor with kids can use these therapies with kids. And I had the same frustration when I went through these master's program, which I went through team, you see, thinking like, okay, great. Now I know what theories look like with adults, but how do I make this for kids? So here we're going to take each one of the theories and we are going to look at what it looks like with kids and adolescents. All right, so I am doing this one because I am a play therapist and the style of play therapy I practice is child-centered play therapy, which is, you know, the adaptation of person-centered theory. Um, so I'm a play therapist for Mesquite ISD's Free Counseling Center who serves all Mesquite ISD students. I also, you know, teach classes at TAMUC. I was a school counselor for seven years. I'm a licensed professional counselor, supervisor, registered play therapist, and certified in child-centered play therapy, which is the kind that I practice. I've also done some play therapy research in the school setting. All right, so let's just kind of talk about theories and kids in general, kind of want to back up a little bit. All theories can be scaffolded to be more concrete, which will meet the differences in development for kids and adolescents. Some theories look easier when you first look at them to scaffold and make for kids and adolescents, make them more concrete than others they all have ways they can be done. So don't, don't let that turn you off of a theory just because you can't see how it can work with kids. One way theories that have, have been adapted for kids is through play therapy. So there are many different kinds of play therapy theoretical orientations. The one I'm gonna talk about today is child-centered play therapy. There's Adlerian play therapy and there's cognitive behavioral play therapy. There's lots of different styles of play therapy and it's just taking these theories and applying them through play to kids. So they all have kind of different um, orientations and ways that they approach play. Other ways that theories can be adapted to work with kids and adolescents would be Santre therapy. There's different styles of Santre just like there's different styles of play therapy. There can add in activities to therapy, expressive arts. Those are other ways to scaffold these different theories. I still want you to focus on choosing one theory and choose the theory that fits you personally, your own worldview, how you see what people come into the world with, how we get messed up and how we change. Pick the theory that fits you best, then work on learning how to scaffold it and make it more concrete for kids and adolescents. Pick the one that best fits you. Don't pick the one that you think is gonna be easiest or that, that you think can be adapted best to a specific population. You are going to be the change agent and you're going to be adapting the theory to fit different clients and different issues. I also wanna say a little something about theories. Guys, you know as well as I do, these were all made up by old white guys. Um, all the theories can be adapted to fit a variety of different clients from different backgrounds. We can change and make multicultural considerations, and these theories can work with anybody. You are the change agent for that. All right, so I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about why. Why do kids need therapy and you know maybe for you guys in in you know counseling classes this is kind of a duh but some of these numbers for me when I was looking up this research were pretty staggering that the age of onset median age of onset for anxiety disorders is the age of six and anxiety disorders in kids don't always look the same as they do in adults they're not always that nervousness hand wringing sometimes it can be very explosive and outward ADHD and behavior disorders, median age of onset is 11. Mood disorders would be 13. Um, and onset of all lifetime mental health disorders, 50% of them happen by are onset by age 14, 75% by age 24. So this is just showing you like why we need to have early interventions for kids. And in many cases, research has shown 
that the school counselor is the only counselor that kids are gonna see. So I am a firm believer in high quality school counseling. All right, <laughs> love me a meme. So you're counseling kids and not using play therapy. Therapy, tell me how well that's going. Play therapy is what needs to be done with kids, especially under seven. Now I have talked to other professionals who don't know a lot about child and development or play therapy and they say, well, if they're verbal and they can talk, like why can't they do regular talk therapy? Well, just because you can talk and hold on a conversation doesn't mean that you can process and do the work therapeutically at the level that needs to be done under seven. So play therapy is good up to age, you know, nine, 10, 11, or even beyond, especially if you have um, kiddos who have neuro differences or are maybe nonverbal. Play therapy can be done at any age, but especially seven and under play is what needs to be done. All right, so let's define what play therapy is. So this is a definition for any kind of play therapy. Play therapy is a developmentally appropriate intervention for children three to 11 that allows children to communicate in their natural language play. And that comes from Gary Landreth, who is the father of child-centered play therapy, specifically child-centered play therapy, and I'm gonna abbreviate it as CCPT throughout this presentation, is the most used type of play therapy and it's the most researched as well. So we're gonna go through a little bit of research um, to show because, I, you know, as I had a friend who was a teacher when I was a school counselor, I did play therapy in the school setting and this teacher called it that hippie BS because when you kind of talk about play therapy, kind of sounds crazy. Oh, kids play and they get better? Yes, because of the specific things done in session. It may sound kind of crazy, but it works. So here's some research showing that play therapy really is well researched and has positive effects in a variety of areas. Um, and a review of 93 studies found in a large treatment effect size. If you haven't had um, 595 yet, you'll have it at some point and you'll kind of talk about effect sizes. 0 0.80 is a really good one. One would be like perfect. Um, Baggerly, Ray, and Bratton reviewed more recent research studies. Well, I guess 2000 to 2009 is not that recent anymore. And 23 showed positive effects two showed mixed results in two of the studies, so highly effective. Play therapy has also been studied in school. So reviewing studies, these guys, Ray Armstrong, and you may recognize that name Armstrong. Yes, he is our own Dr. Armstrong, Falcon and Jane, reviewed studies in the school setting and found statistically significant results for all kinds of different problems, external, internal, total problems, self-efficacy, academic, and other behaviors. Recent study in school setting shows play therapy is has been effective with kids with ADHD. Robinson, that's me. Uh, Simpson, as in Dr. Simpson, and Dr. Hot, who used to work here. Research shows that if children get help for mental health issues, they most commonly receive services at school. All right, here's a cool little summary. Uh, this comes from the Association for Play Therapy that shows different kinds of play therapy research and the outcomes and improvement. And there's the uh, link for that if you are interested in looking for more about that. All right, so what is play therapy and how does that compare to person-centered? How did we get person-centered and get child-centered play therapy from it? All right, so first of all, play therapy, any style, is not simply using toys or reading a book in therapy. Just like counseling is not simply talking to someone. If, if it worked like that, then any friend who ever griped to another friend or talked to another friend um, would be doing therapy. Play is not just using toys in therapy. Play therapy is a theoretical orientation that requires specific training on the protocol to use with children. And TMUC offers that class taught by the wonderful Dr. Armstrong who has trained me as well. Um, and I highly suggest if you wanna work with kids, take that class. All right, so here's comparing the tenets of child-centered play therapy um, by Dr. Gary Landreth to person-centered, what you guys are learning and reading about in your chapter. So Gary Landreth has 10 tenets for relating to children. Children are not miniature adults. Children are people. That may seem kind of like a duh, but I know a lot of adults and sometimes we don't always treat uh, kids like people. Children are unique and worthy of respect. Children are resilient. Children have an inherent tendency towards growth and maturity. 
Children are capable of positive self-direction. Children's natural language is play. Children have the right to remain silent. Children will take the therapeutic experience to where they need to be. And children's growth cannot be speeded up. All right, now let's compare those tenets to person-centered therapy. Person-centered is non-directive, so is child-centered play therapy. The relationship is rooted in a way of being that congruence, unconditional positive regard, accurate empathic understanding, so is play therapy. People, it, person center believes people are generally good and have the capacity to make positive choices and growth. Same thing as the tenants to the left here. People have freedom, choice, values, personal responsibility, autonomy, purpose, and meaning. Sounds pretty similar to those tenants. We have a natural potential that we can actualize and through that find meaning. Very similar to what this says as children have an inherent tendency towards growth and maturity. Just using different words to say the same thing. With the right conditions, a person will naturally grow in positive ways. And listening, reflecting, empathy, and clarification are all used in the therapeutic process. So you can see how the tenets, um, the framework of person-centered theory has been taken and applied into child-centered play therapy. We're going to look a little bit more at the specifics of what it looks like. All right, so the play therapist, as a person, the counselor has these be with attitudes. It, they convey, convey in the therapy, I am here, I hear you, I understand, I care. They focus on the donut, not the whole. Very similar with person-centered. You are looking at the person not at the problem, not at the behaviors. Yes, those are symptoms, those are parts of what you are looking at, but you are looking at the person and focusing on the person instead of the problem. Same thing in child center play therapy. All right, I love this little graphic. Everyone tries to make me into lemonade, but I just can't be something I'm not. Reminds me a lot of person-centered and child-centered play therapy. We are not trying to change, make this person what we think they should be, we are looking at them and helping them to actualize, facilitating that growth. All right, children communicate using specific toys. So here's a list. And these cho toys are carefully chosen and they are chosen for specific reasons. You've got real life toys, doll families, pacifier and nursing bottles and babies, sponge and towels, dishes, silverware, pans, stove refrigerator like a little mini kitchen, fruits and vegetables, school bus, cars, trucks, airplanes, play phone, a medical kit, band-aids, animals, puppets, play money and cash register. Those are all the real life kind of things. Then you have aggressive release toys, a pounding bench and hammer. That might be something that you could pound nails in with, uh, with a hammer, a bot bag, you know, those punching kind of bag things, toy soldiers, tinker toys, um, a dart gun with uh, darts that can be shot, a rubber knife, a rope and handcuffs, um, aggressive thing, animals like alligators or a rubber snake. And I've had some people when I explain this, you know, people who are not trained counselors say like, oh my gosh, you have these things in there. Like you really, you have a gun and a knife? Yes. In therapy, in this safe controlled environment is where we want kids expressing these feelings so that they can release them process them, work through them, and learn how to handle them in healthy, non-destructive manners. All right, then you also have creative expression toys. Chalk erasers, paint if you have um, access to water. I don't actually do paints in my office because I don't have um, an easy way to clean it up, but I do have markers and chalk and paper and all kinds of things. Egg cartons, because those are great things to like build with and destroy, Play-Doh, dress up stuff like firefighter and other things, musical instruments, um, a sand tray, spoon funnel pail. Um, many playrooms have a big like sandbox type thing. I just have a sand tray that I also use for sand tray therapy in mine. Pipe cleaners, popsicle sticks, construction paper, scissors, glue tape, all that kind of good stuff is in there. Now, if you'll notice when you're looking at these toys, there's not anything electronic in here. These are all used for creative expression so the child can use their imagination and symbolically play out what's going on with them. 
All right, so here's how child-centered play therapy kind of works. This is a real non-directive style. So kids aren't coming in and they're not, not made to talk about anything. They're not even made to talk at all. Kids do not have to talk for play therapy to work. The magic is in the relationship. So the environment here is highly important. It should be a safe environment and facilitate growth and exploration. With all these toys organized um, in a way that kind of makes sense, you don't necessarily put the scary toys next to the not scary toys. You don't put the gun right next to the baby dolls um, and you kind of organize them that way. Um, and they're all out where kids can see them, not in drawers or behind things. The relationship is key here. The relationship between the child and the play therapist, that's the agent of change. The time isn't structured. Kids aren't, you know, taken through specific tasks. The therapist doesn't um, schedule things or plan things for the time. The kid is walked into the playroom and the session starts by saying, in here, you can play with any of these things in many of the ways you want. And then the kid is free to play or not play, to talk or not talk, however they choose. The child will lead the session where the child needs to be. And towards the end of the session, there's a five minute and one minute notifications. Hey, we have five minutes left in our time. Hey, there's one minute left in our time. And for child-centered play therapy, the kid doesn't clean up. The therapist cleans up. And the thinking behind that is because we want kids to be as free as possible in their expression. We don't want them to limit what they do in the playroom in therapy because they're worried they have to pick it all up. So I have to structure some extra time between sessions because some sessions are messier than others. All right, here's how the responses look. So you kind of know about what the playroom has in it um, and kind of the framework of child-centered play therapy. And But once the kid gets playing and doing things, here's the reflections, some examples um, of the types of reflections that a therapist might say. We're reflecting feelings. That is a big one. Things like you feel angry. We're reflecting the content. If kids come in and say, oh, I got in trouble at school, we're saying, oh, you got in trouble at school. Tracking their behavior. You picked that up. And items in play therapy and child center play therapy are not named until the child names them. So I say a lot of this and that, you put that there until a kid names it because it might look like a bus to me, but it might be a spaceship to a child. And so I want them to really lead me and tell me. Facilitating decision making. Oh, in here you can decide how to do that. Facilitating creativity. That can be whatever you want. Facilitating the relationship. You want me to know that you like me. Sometimes kids will ask me, what's your favorite color? Or do you like this too? And really, instead of saying, answering that question or saying, yeah, I like that. I say, oh, you want me to know that you like me and you want to know that I like you too. And I do. That's really what kids are looking for. And then limits are set when needed, not before. Limits might be set for safety. Um, you can't stand up on that and jump off. Um, and there's a specific limit setting process. I'm not going to get into that now, but if you take play therapy, you'll learn all about it. Limits might be set for structuring of the time. Time is over and it has to be over. Um, and, and to protect the, the toys or the therapist, the things are not for breaking. I'm not for shooting in the face with the dark gun, those kind of things. And another note here is that we don't ask questions. We don't ask the kid, what does that mean? Or, or even say things like, really tell me more about that or anything like that. We're not asking questions. We are totally letting the kid lead and show us. All right, naming feelings, that's really the biggest bang for your buck. And you guys know this, you're counselors, but I kind of thought I would um, highlight this piece. Even with older kids, when I have older kids that I see that I'm not doing play therapy with, I'm gonna use that tracking, that reflective responding, especially when I'm doing expressive arts, any kind of art, sand tray, anything like that, because sometimes what kids are doing is just as important, even more important than what they're saying. And so we want to highlight those feelings. And so I've got these little uh, lights in my office, or actually I did prior to COVID. Um, and they're just those push button ones. I got like a pack of five of them on Amazon for like $3.99. And I took a Sharpie and I drew those emojis. And so mm -hmm. kids can touch these, turn them on for what emotions they're feeling. It's great to start a conversation with older kids about you can feel more than one emotion at a time. I just thought I'd throw that out there. 
All right, how do I know what's important? In play therapy, it's about repetition. When a kid does something over and over and over, that's a clue to me that this means something to them. Intensity. Sometimes kids play and they're exploring the room or they're going from one thing to another and then they have that laser locked in focus. And I know, oh, something has changed and I can feel it in the session. When they have something with intensity, whether it's beaten, the snot out of the bot bag, or they are just focused on whatever it is they're trying to do. I know, okay, that's a clue to me that this is meaningful, that this is symbolic important. And then context. Sometimes we know the context of what's going on in the world or what's going on with the kid. And I'll tell a little story about my own daughter who's four. Um, she, you know, obviously with the coronavirus, we've been talking about it, how to keep it safe, especially because my mom is extremely high risk. Um, and so we've been talking about that. And so my little girl took her animals and her little doctor kit that we have at home and she had, to, and she doctored up one of her cats and she, she isolated her cat and said, this cat's really sick and the other ones can't go near it because they're going to get sick too. And, and so for me, that was context. I knew exactly what she was processing. She was processing all those changes in her little world. Now we very seldom get that lucky as far as play is concerned. It, it is very seldom that I can say, oh, this means this. That's not what I do in play therapy. I can make educated guesses and I can take some of these clues based on what I know and the repetition and the intensity to kind of know what something, that something is important and meaningful to a child, but there's no list of this means this. Um, and so it, I have to be very careful with leaping to conclusions um, and things like that because uh, it's symbolic, so I don't always know what it means inside a kid's own head. Just kind of wanted to throw that out there. All right, so here's some example playrooms. Now, I started my uh, counseling career as a school counselor, so this was the first school counseling office I had, and I was very, uh, very lucky to have a nice office, and so I didn't want the toys played with all the time because my office doubled as, you know, room for 504 meetings and seeing older kids and you know, places where I would sit with the kid who was, you know, losing their mind and having a, having a hard time. So I had my toys laid out on these shelves and my mom made these curtains to cover them. And so I would open them only when I was doing a play therapy session. And I would do little limited 30 minute play therapy sessions. Um, and I called it play counseling because school counselors don't do therapy, even though we're trained to. I won't get on that soapbox today. I had a sand tray and you can see there um, in this one like little markers and crayons and whatever and I had a little whiteboard with paper and all kinds of the different toys from the different categories. Here's a little bit closer up of what and how I had them organized. Fluffy things, then you have the aggressive stuff and some costumes and then you have army men and cars and trucks and all the kind of doll houses and things. Now in my office, now I'm very fortunate to have a nice big doll house. I didn't have one in my other office, so I kind of set up these shelves like a doll house, you know. Um, and then all the creative stuff and baby dolls. That's what that looked like. All right, now my uh, next school counseling office was much smaller and it had doors on both sides. And so I had my office and table and sand tray on one side with my little couch that I've taken from place to place to place. And then on the other side, I had shelves, and this is how I had my toys, same curtains, organized there with those little tension rod things. All right, now here is the very best playroom that I've had, and it's my office now because I am a play therapist. And it, um, so you'll see in here, you know, the nice kitchen and the dollhouse and the babies. This is actually what it looked like before COVID. Um, if you're interested, you can shoot me an email and I'll kind of explain how I've changed things for COVID. But this is what play therapy is designed to look like. And I've got that sand tray there that's on wheels and you can see the couch. Um, there's the couch and you can see, because my office, uh, my playroom is also my office. My husband who does construction stuff built my sand tray, but he also built me this really wonderful desk that closes and locks all up. So my phone and my computer and all that stuff that I don't want kids to play with and mess with is hidden. So everything they can see in the room is able for them to be played with. And you can see the bot bag and I have like a little basketball net on my door in this bottom left one and my little um, dress up clothes and stuff all hung up and chalkboard and see all those things. All right, just a few ideas for the school setting. If you you know you're going to go into the school setting, and you're like, well, but how do I have kids one on one? How do I not get interrupted? How do I not get called out on the walkie talkie or the phone or the PA or any of the million things that we know happen in school? 
Um, so here's just a couple of ideas I had to minimize the interruptions. I set that up with my administrators and teachers that I don't answer the phone or the door when, I, when I'm with the student. In fact, I had a little don't knock sign. I had little signs that I flipped around that said in session or in a classroom or in the cafeteria or in the library, like I had one for everything or off campus or whatever. Um, and then I also had this privacy please sign. You know, people still knocked, but it cut down on that a lot. All right, interested in more about play therapy? Here's a couple of video links. Uh, the first one comes from UNT and they have a giant play therapy website with all kinds of stuff and information and research and all the good things. Um, and so they have come out with a couple of videos that explain play therapy in kid friendly language and to parents. And it really gives a great overview of that. Um, the next one is Dr. Gary Landreth. He's the father of child centered play therapy. He's our guru. Um, he shows a clip here for play therapy, you know, and it's towards the end of the session so you can see some of the tracking and how he sits. Um, I sit in a chair just like he does in one particular place and I don't move from there unless the child invites me into their play or invites me and asks me to move. And then the last one is a video um, that shows a playtime of someone with a child in their own home. And there's something called child parent relationship therapy, which is based on child centered play therapy. And it teaches parents the tenants and how to do play therapy in their own home with their kids, which is very healing and wonderful. All right, if you have questions, here's my email address. Um, and then here are some references. And I will close with one thing about, about theory. When I took the play therapy class, I just, it fit. I am a person in non-directive, and so person-centered and gestalt, which are very similar kind of in their structure and how they answer those three theory questions about what we come into the world with, um, that nature of the person, the maladjustment, and how we change, they answer them in very similar ways. And so play therapy, child-centered play therapy, fits very well for me, and that is how I work with kids. When I work with adolescents and adults, um, I work from Gestalt framework because it's a very similar framework. Gestalt is really how I see the world. Um, and then from there, I can adapt my techniques and things to fit clients with, from a variety of backgrounds and from a variety um, of different everything. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to throw that out there that like you're not bouncing from theory to theory. You're not picking and choosing pieces of theories based on what you think works with this client. You want to stick something, stick with something and use it because that's where the best outcomes are and that's where you're going to be covered ethically. Um, okay, so 